Good evening. And I want to welcome all of you, and I'm really excited to have such a large crowd here. It's much appreciated. And I also want to extend a thank you to Trish Nelson, who's the organizer for this and instructor here at the school, and Peter Pappas, who's sitting behind her, who's uh, her co-instructor. We have students here from College of Alameda and from Laney College, perhaps others, and a lot of friends and family who I really appreciate their taking the time to join us in this. Also, a thank you to Peralta Group of Schools. They are providing the technology and cameras. This presentation is uh, Ernest Hemingway, the world's first social media superstar. And it's something that I came across um, kind of inadvertently looking at writings of Hemingway and piecing together some of the timeline and history and looking at some of the events surrounding his work and how those events were affecting his writing. And then I started to notice something that uh, seemed to be um, a part of his process that was really curating the social media in his time and it has a lot of application for people in social media today. So with that, I'll get started. Ernest Hemingway's social media trending amassed five billion hits, views, shares, and followers over his writing career, 1920 to 1960. Approximately 3.4 billion of those hits, views, shares, and followers were the topic of his lifestyle, as lifestyle invention, as lifestyle reinventions. These focus on his accomplishments as an explorer, hunter, fisherman, gourmand, boozer, traveler, boxer, promoter, master of landscapes, master of cityscapes, friend of gypsies, friend of royalty, friend of beggars, loyal friend and backstabber, pilgrim, trekker, and expert of the bullring and the saloons with a dedication and a perseverance to become an aficionado, an expert in these lifestyles and pursuits. Approximately 1.7 billion of the trends contain his prose, poetry, journalism, and commentary on his writing. Hemingway merged romance and reality as an author of fiction, as a journalist, while covering some of the most important international events in his lifetime, and as a playwright and as a screenplay author. Delivering the five billion trends, Hemingway curated 39 media platforms with content that was authorized and that was unsolicited. That's a tedious and arduous task. When we put it all together, we have lifestyle invention, prose and curating, a demanding and consuming passion. His lifestyles were flamboyant, florid and dramatic, invented, reinvented, rejuvenated and re-energized over time. So to remain current and trending. His prose is emotionally pale in comparison, but his output is prodigious, prophetic and reflective. His persistence in daily curating 39 media platforms is tedious, requiring ramrod discipline. And we'll see how all of this ties together in creating the image of Hemingway that revolves around his work and around his lifestyles. Ernest Hemingway wrote more and was written about more than any other person in the 20th century and to date in the 21st century. Capturing and analyzing the matrix of social media platform social media content by year over his 44 year career required a spreadsheet of 4,000 cells, 3,000 of which are footnoted. The text that I'm presenting tonight has an additional 38 footnotes and all of that is compiled from 113 source documents. <clears throat> this is a breakthrough research pre presenting Hemingway's success from the point of view of his process management, his work, his lifestyle reinvention, as it contributed to his social media superstardom in his time. By focusing on Hemingway as a social media superstar, we, we find that he provides a step-by-step -step lesson on behavior, how to work, how to prepare, and importantly, how to participate in the rituals, mores, folkways, and customs, the events that demonstrate an expertise and provide one with an identity as an aficionado. That is what provides the credibility. The starting point for all of this dates to 1926. Hemingway claimed he would make himself the best known writer in his time. That was an honorable objective. At the same time, Hemingway started the process of lifestyle invention and reinvention. Eight years later in 1934, his publisher, Scribner and Sons, 
decided that there was a bigger advantage to promoting his lifestyle and lifestyle invention and reinvention than there was in promoting his books in an effort to sell books. 26 years later, in 1952, Hemingway was the best known person in America, not just the best known writer in America. As an example, Life Magazine's issue, September 1st, 1952, sold, which was a combination of articles about Hemingway and a presentation of his novella, The Old Man and the Sea, sold 5.3 million copies in three days. With hand-on readership and um, with just uh, conversations about, the, about this issue, it reached more than 30% of the population in age 18 and older in six months. And so if you combine the Life Magazine issue with all of the, the conversations and the reviews, it actually reached 65% of the population over a period of a year. We'll look later at Hemingway and Kanye West trending side by side, a little mano y mano. As a teaser, Kanye's most popular albums, The College Dropout and 808 and Heartbreak, sold a combined 5.1 million copies over 12 years. Commentary, caricature, and social media penetration reached just 25% of the population age 18 and older over that 12-year period. Hemingway applied himself to his life as it should be led in his time, using the social media of his time. Importantly, we can get some lessons, and that statement is strong. But in the period 1920 to 1960, we'll call that Hemingway's epoch, and the period 1990 to 2016 and advancing into the future, we have much in common. We'll explore these epochs later in the presentation, but to introduce them now, both epochs are initiated by a revolution. Both epochs unleash progress through development of industry and modern ways of production and living. Both epochs unleash unprecedented change that the, the change that occurred in Hemingway's time is still important for us today as we feel the change that's occurring today will be important in the future. And both epochs are peopled by exhibitionists. And those people that can manage their exhibitionist tendencies together with the, de the developments and the evolution are the ones that will be able to become uh, prospering social media superstars. So when we look, want to look at this, we have to look at social media as a definition. Boiled down, it's a social network plus media. Mark Zuckerberg defines social media as an efficient means for people to communicate, get information, and share information. Mr. Zuckerberg's definition, in fact, the term social media draws on the term social network taken from research done by the French sociologist Emile Durkheim in 1897. He developed the term social network. Media defined today as it was in Durkheim's time. Marion Webster says that it's a means of mass communication, especially television, radio, newspaper, and today the internet, regarded collectively. Measurements today are the same as they were then. Sharing, views, followers, trends, uh, views, followers, and, um, and sharing. So all of this is consistent from e epoch to epoch. And what we want to do is to look at how some of this is going to work. So we have uh, all of this do-it-yourself, exhibitionism, efficient technologies for the time, messages and content that are authorized and unauthorized, and all measurable as his views, shares, and followers. We could say that a little bit more about it, that in Hemingway's time, it was America's first measured generation. The methods used for measuring social behavior, personal behavior, beliefs, and patterns of, uh, of interaction are the same today that they were in Durkheim's time. That hasn't changed. We think of these as being new, but in fact they've been in use for generations. If we look at this uh, penetration of social media in Hemingway's epoch, we track his reach from the start of his public career by decade, starting in 1920 to the end of his career, we can see a growth. In 1920, he reached about 5% of the population. By 1940, his reach uh, was uh, measured at 20% of the American population. And by 1960, he was reaching 40% of the population. To put those into perspective, we look at it in terms of the matrix of social media for the population age 18 and older. 
which reveals that Hemingway's Epoch, 62 million people had between three and 10 hits view shares and followings per year, and that grew to seven to 25 hits view shares and uh, followings per year, or 62 million people in the year 1960. Now remember the population in 1920 through 1960 was much smaller than the population today. When we look at social media, we need to look at what these platforms are. Today there are actually fewer platforms for social media than there were in Hemingway's time. And a lot of the social media from Hemingway's time, or the media from Hemingway's time, is found on the internet and uh, um, in mobile devices today. So the, the technology has changed, but many of the, of the uh, actual presentation of the media has not changed. And if we look at it a little bit more closely, we see that the newspaper syndicates and other media network penetration combined with hand-on readership, letter writing, and discussions created the viral networks then as today. And the views, hits, shares, and followers, or the total viral distribution, were greater than the subscription and paid circulation then as today. So when we, when we analyze these things, we start to look at it and, and get a feeling that the, the, the writings of a lot of the analysts at the time, that the, 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 at this time, that the brain hasn't changed, but the technology has, just suggests that what we saw then is comparable to what we saw now. And we see that in Hemingway's time, content came directly from Hem Hemingway in a phalanx of professional reviewers, columnists, and critics. That included people like Malcolm Cowley, Edwin Wilson, Robert McAlman, names that you might know, and they were the Flint Sparks that took Hemingway's words and put them out to the public on a much broader platform. Hemingway built from strength to strength. If you recall that that uh, issue of September 1st, 1952 for Life magazine had the reach of 65% of the population age, 60, age 18 and older, which has not been matched um, by any media or any person. So now we take a look at Hemingway's lessons on how to become a social media superstar. Three important elements. His talent, which he called his action in his living this life. Reinvention, which is communicating or doing this life. And curating, which was the management. Now some of these were visible to the public and some of them weren't. And in, because of the amount of data that was available, the presentation of Hemingway's accomplishments had to be broken up into five-year periods. And if we look at two five-year periods, which we will in a minute, one surrounding the publication of the book For Whom the Bell Tolls and the other surrounding the publication of the, the novella The Old Man and the Sea, each of those periods he achieved a billion hits, views, shares, and followers. And the context and circumstances of this, when we look at them, uh, we can make a comparison to Kanye West today. And as I, as I mentioned, we want, to, we want to look at what was achieved by both in tracking their social media trending. In 1937 to 1941, Ernest Hemingway published, had five books published, four cinema releases, 31 articles published, and national advertisements, more than 150 reviews, caricatures, and commentaries. By comparison, and that, that, gen that generated for him uh, a total of 985 million hits, views, shares, and followers. Kanye West, 2010 to 2014, achieved 445 million, with YouTube online, Facebook online, Twitter, Vogue online magazine and print, Gentlemen's Quarterly, Nylon People, with release of 19 albums, a romance with Kim Kardashian, with daily postings, Birth of Baby North, with daily postings, national advertisements, and more than 150 reviews, caricatures, and commentaries. So what, what we see is that Hemingway was doing something that made him more successful over that period of time than people in the social media are doing today. And if we look at it, over his 40-year career, this is the, the pattern that we see. Even in his slow times when he was not publishing books, he was amassing huge numbers of followers. And that's attributable to his lifestyle. When we look at the two, two periods of the highest number of hits, um, 
and like actually three periods. The 986 million was surrounding the publication of For Whom the Bell Tolls. The 834 million was surrounding the publication of The Old Man and the Sea, and the 984 million came with people interested in finding out about him at the time of his death. Hemingway had a way of doing things, and you may have heard of Hemingway's iceberg, which he, he described as being um, a way that he could write with an aesthetic that if the writer of prose knows enough about what he is writing, he may omit things that he knows that the reader knows. If the writer is writing truly enough, the reader will have the feeling of these things without them being written. The dignity of a movement of an iceberg is due to the one-eighths being above the water. With Hemingway, we see that the one-eighths above the water are the things he wanted to attract attention to. That description was very confusing to me. I couldn't quite grasp it. So when I looked at it more closely, I said, if he's drawing attention to his writings and saying that there's a mystery to how he's able to write it, then that's not a satisfactory explanation. We have to look below the surface at the seven-eighths of the iceberg that is concealed by the water. And in that we see that he spent a significant amount of his time with self-promotion, inventing lifestyles and reinventing them, rituals and routine, correspondence, study, and the projection of his lifestyles surrounded by warfare, bullfights, fishing, boxing, hunting, drinking, food, travel, products, all of the things that people talk about him. He did this with the 39 channels, and I've just highlighted a few here, that started back in 1920 with, with the newspaper syndications, talking films, things we take for granted today, mass circulation magazines, mass advertising, television, and national broadcasts. To us, these are things we take for granted. In Hemingway's time, they were all new, and he took advantage of that and was one of the pioneers in getting his message across using them. If we look at it from another perspective, and we'll use the period of time 19, in, uh, 1937 to 1941, Hemingway had a product cycle in which he would be paid every step of the way to write newspaper articles and, and magazine articles in syndication. These would become the notes and the chapters for his books, his novels, his nonfiction, collections, plays, portable collections. There would then be a, a whole series of endorsements and other writer, writers praising him. Those books would be made into movies and when television was available into television serialization. At the same time there was academic writing and a lot of other people participating in writing forwards, references, prefaces, letters, statements, caricatures about Hemingway. And that all continued on into conversations about Hemingway's lifestyles and about his work. When we want to understand a little bit about how we put all of this together, we can think of it in a, in a slightly different way. How did he know to create and merge his writing and lifestyle and curating when others didn't? One of the things that was found out was that by looking at Hemingway's personal library. He was very well read. His library was filled with literature from Europe, Old Testament, Catholic writings, journals of pilgrims, and other re holy pilgrimages, history, sociology, mores, rituals, folkways. He got th this style of study by his acquaintances with the writings of Charles Augustine saint beuve a respected 19th century critic who said that in order to understand an author, one must put certain questions about the author and has to answer them. And in, by doing that, you would be able to grasp the author. And these included, what were his religious ideas? How did the spectacle of nature affect him? How did he behave in the matter of women of money? Was he rich, poor? What was his diet? What was his daily routine? What were his vices and weaknesses? Answering that simple set of questions is what Hemingway did in all of his work. So he seized on St. Beauvoir's advice to the public and presented himself to the world as if the world, so that the world wouldn't have to do any research and find out what he was about. And that was a very important step. 
that by doing that, he was able to make his, what he called his stream of consciousness, mainstream, becoming the stream of consciousness for his generation. And by doing that, he became the center of attention for his generation and following generations. So Hemingway's voice demonstrates his thoughts, his fears, his lifestyle, his invention and reinvention, and his success. They become the voice of the public, the everyman, the blue collar, white collar, and artist alike. Hemingway made his stream of consciousness the stream of consciousness of the public. And when questioned about it, Hemingway diverted attention again, describing the stream of consciousness as his personal achievement, his discovery of what one truly felt regarding plumbing the depths of information to get to the true gen. He uses all of these words that, that are code words, but a lot of it is meant to draw attention to his writings and divert attention from his work on his, on, on, on his social media curating. And when we see what happens with this, is that in 1940, with the release of For Whom the Bell Tolls, and we, in the number distribution here, uh, this achieved hits, views, shares, and followers of 232 million with a frequency distribution that uh, most people saw Hemingway two to three times per year with about 1% uh, of the population having hits, views, shares, and followers of more than 10 times per year. And this work in 1940 included release of For Whom the Bell Tolls, the fifth column, book and play, reviews by other authors, advertisements, point of sale display for his books, letters published, face-to-face -face conversations, syndicated newspaper articles, magazine articles about his lifestyle and about the books. So back to the iceberg and how he put it into practice. He actually had about a dozen steps that he would take in order to curate his social media platforms. Part of it started with a daily routine and ritual. So every day he'd be up at 5 a.m. and working till about 1 in the afternoon. From 1 to 2 he'd exercise, 2 to 4 he would answer correspondence, 4 to 8 he would study and do research for his writings, 8 at night till 1 in the morning he'd be partying, then he'd go to sleep. All of that is what drove the work on the bottom of the, uh, underneath the, the seven-eighths of the iceberg under the water surface. The writing itself was just a reflection of that. And if we look at it from this, this mechanism, as I say, we have the focus of work every day. Uh, we have a, a situation where he says that he needs to become an aficionado, a technical expert, practicing the mores, rituals, and restraints of an aficionado. You have to study in the mode of St. Beauvoir, Luis Agassiz, Ignacio de, Lo de Loyola, Briat Savarin, William James, Marcel Proust, and Ezra Pound. These are all names that you might come across in your classes. But they're, and they're all influential to people and writers in particular during Hemingway's era. And how? They all introduced to him different things that he incorporated in his writing. We know what Saint-Pauvour introduced. Ignacio de Loyola introduced composition in place. That was a method that he used to put himself into a situation with all of his mental and emotional attention so that he could draw from it what a person would feel and see. William James was a cosmopolitan and America's first writer on psychology and self-help. Ezra Pound demanded a command of a type of perception, a kind of transmission of knowledge only from concrete manifestations. With Ezra Pound, Hemingway would walk the, the religious pilgrim trails in the south of France and Italy because a person walking would be able to notice things. A person riding in a vehicle would only see things. A routine had to be maintained. Rituals, mores, folkways, including spirituality, had to be maintained. And morality is a ritual for Hemingway. In the, the ritual is always right. The morality is always variable. Other points were discipline and repetition, pilgrimage, and to live like a local, not an expatriate, not a visitor, not a tourist. All of these things come into play, and you see it in all of his work. The, when we get to the to looking at, at how these other things can come together with 
Kanye West and Hemingway having a conversation and Kanye asking, how do I achieve these numbers? Hemingway can tell him just to follow those points that I just raised by making your stream of consciousness become the community stream of consciousness. For Kanye, Hemingway would recommend that he takes up a cause to write about, publish songs about, make movies about, and the one that would be most appropriate for him would be opioid use in suburban America in the Midwest. For that, Kanye must do what Hemingway would do. He's going to have to move to suburbia. He's going to have to meet with opioid users, with community leaders. He's going to have to write about it, write songs about it, release them. He's going to have to make movies about it and get those all on social media. He's going to have to become the stream of consciousness for America on this topic. Frequency of messaging is important, and that uh, lets critics, supporters, and believers, and those who are ambivalent, that understand that you know what you're talking about. So he needs to be in the media frequently. He can start on YouTube, and he can then go from YouTube to other forms of media that would be proper for that type of an expression. This would enable Kanye to amass some numbers that would be greater than what he's getting today. Hemingway would say that Kanye is acting a bit like, like a buffoon and that he would be uh, an, an un, a, a live nerve that is receiving and transmitting information simultaneously. Hemingway wouldn't like that. So he would get him to discipline himself and to work more diligently. Other things to be considered and the, the, the similarities that can be drawn between Hemingway's epoch and ours are the the periods of time and all of the events surrounding this time. So if we look at Hemingway's time, we had this revolution occurring with what we call the end of empire, the, dis the dissolution of the Austro-Hungarian, British, Russian, Ottoman, Spanish, German empires. And with that, the loss of something called the masculinity of empire. That was replaced with something called the masculinity of survival. It came about because the, during World War I, the officers that had royal appointment, the, the people from the uh, wealthy establishment in these countries were killed at a rate nine times higher per capita than the enlisted men. So they were out. After the war, the enlisted men rose to positions of power and creativity within the communities, and they started their own revolution. This held all the way up to the 1960s, and you had these different labels applied to it. You had the moderns, the depression generation, World War II generation, the lucky few, the beats, the baby boomers. Throughout all of those changes, this masculinity of survival was retained. And what it meant was that from a larger context, uh, in, in going from psychology to sociology, we see that the the opportunity to create new systems and to create new environments also led to a need to be able to reinvent yourself to keep up with it. And that's essentially what the masculinity of survival was, reinvention. We see that again today. But to put it in perspective, in 1920 to 1960, the, uh, or 19, uh, 1920 to 1950, 49% of all patents issued within, in the country were issued. The 130 years prior to that, that patents were recorded, 50% were issued. So you had a rate of change that was four times faster, and people had to learn to cope with it. Hemingway was able to be out front on this and to be able to provide lifestyle instruction on how to cope with it. And that kept him mainstream and kept him in the public eye. When we look at today in our epoch, the starting point comes for the Generation X called the New Lost Generation with the fall of the Berlin Wall, which brought about the end of the Soviet bloc, the Middle East bloc was started to create. Chinese isolation was broken, and there was always the threat of global annihilation. The masculinity of survival continued, and the masculinity of fear was declining we see that that is one of the contributors to this ongoing exhibitionist tendencies amongst people in, in uh, today's world. 
and that's something that is being pursued on the social media. So if the process for Hemingway, which we say has uh, enabled him to achieve such a, a high ranking in social media, can be followed today, a couple of the takeaway points would just be that you have to have the discipline, you have to have the plan, you need to have a product cycle, and you need to keep working to put these things forward repeatedly on different media platforms. And there needs to be a consistency in the message. And if, if uh, you want to go through any of the methodology for how this was done, we could do it now. Or if you have any questions. Yes, and it was by looking at the, the uh, readerships of the different medias themselves. So there's, there's published information about the different medias that has to be tied back to events and time frames and who was being published in those. Is that pretty much enabled by sort of internet searching if those big databases can be collected? No, it's all, it's, it was uh, source documents. So over time, people had written a lot of this in bits and pieces, but it hadn't been pulled together. So there were documents that um, showed all of the advertisements that, uh, in fact, there's a book published just last year uh, that showed a lot of the advertisements about Hemingway. There were books that, um, that, that published uh, the, the, the covers of magazines on which he appeared. So then you could go back with those and check the subscription rates and the published hand-on readership and things and start to piece it together. And you were talking about likes, followers, and shares. How should we think about the shares back in the paper age of Hemingway? I read the New York Times, you read the New York Post. We're, we're sitting next to each other on the subway going to work. I finish mine, give it to you. You finish yours and give it to me. In addition, there was, uh, uh, in 1940, the penetration of newspaper distribution in the U.S. was 240% of the population. Everybody read two newspapers. Then there were morning editions, evening editions, weekend editions, Sunday editions. And everybody shared them. You know, you, you go into an office, everybody leaves the newspaper on the desk, next guy picks it up. By 1960, that penetration was 260%. So you had a, an, a, a, a situation in which the population was reading and they were exchanging whatever they were reading. Uh, they use another example that uh, Life magazine, nine, uh, September 1st, 1952, that issue had a six times hand on readership. So people would buy it and hand it on and that was recorded as, uh, as being handed on six times on average. So these things were treated differently then than they are now. When we talk about sharing today, it's I'm on Facebook and I see something and I send it to you, I share it with you. It's the same concept but different process. Yes, Bill. Uh, is it possible to figure out roughly uh, how many times you're going to appear on the cover of the magazine? Yeah. Yes. That's all available. And uh, it's not just major magazines. There was a whole, in fact, there were more than 20 publications that were men's pulp magazines gossip magazines and they would have Hemingway on the cover and articles of uh, you know Hemingway versus Hitler and things like that so these were real macho magazines you know and um, you know and, and there were they were very popular for a long period of time and in fact Esquire magazine that's still around had a publication called Ken and that uh, survived for a number of years but it was there kind of mass distribution macho magazine. There was, uh, you know, and whatever strange name you could think of, you know, Macho Man, Mr. War, all of these things, they were all available then. So you had Life, Time, Collier's, Saturday Evening Post, and a whole lot of other magazines that are not out there anymore. And yes, you can find out 
all of that. And you can get the subscription numbers for each of those issues. Yes? So population in 1920 was much, much less than it is now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. if you're comparing these numbers, mm -hmm. have anybody had hundreds of millions more shares? Like Over a smaller population. Over a smaller population. Yeah. So you're not comparing, you're not translating today comparing this? No. No, so when you look at, when, that's why the, it's stated with both the percentage popu penetration of the population and the actual numbers. Because it's, uh, if in 1940 when you had 232 million hits, views, shares, and followers, within a population of that size at that time, that was a significantly higher penetration than 232 million would be today. As I mentioned, that one instance, 65% penetration age 18 and older versus Kanye West's penetration of 25%. So that's, uh, yes, you have to look at the population and then at the, at the numbers in that time. So what would be the equivalence of Kanye with that famous now compared to him way back then? The penetration is 60%. Oh, yeah, yeah. And 60% age 18 and older, you would be talking about, you know, 200 million or so. Yes. But today, do you think there's also like a, a lot more competition for people's time than there was? No. No way. No. Remember, back at that time, you had the highest rate of change in the history of the country. Everything was changing. Things that you rely on today that, uh, maybe there's a slide on that. Well, let me show you. This slide here just shows something that, uh, oops, if I can get to it. Here's what happened to the population in the war and why this opportunity was created for Americans. You have a typical population pyramid, and that's age distribution. More, more people at a younger age, fewer people at an older age. In the event of a war, the middle part of it is gutted. In World War I, America lost 900,000 people out of 60 million. So all of the, the brains from the US were able to step into the void that was left from the carnage in Europe. And it's not just the war, but the uh, significant numbers were also killed by the uh, flu pandemic that was one of the causes for the end of the war. There just weren't enough soldiers to fight. And if we go a little further on this and we look and we say, okay, what is it that was invented back then that we rely on today? Skyscrapers, automobiles, consumer credit, airlines and mass transportation, travel and airports, recording sound, movies, radios, television, mass advertising, national highway networks, electric lights and homes, cathode ray tube. All televisions were a cathode ray tube before they were a flat screen. Like you guys probably don't know what that is. No. <laughs> Electrification and power plants, telephones, indoor plumbing. We take all of that for granted today. Back then, those were huge innovations. And it didn't happen on a small scale. It happened across the country. The country size is the same. And then before, there weren't roads that connected it. There weren't, there weren't airports. There weren't you know, anything. You, you wanted to get someplace, it was a chore. Nowadays, it's simple. But back then, it was a real chore. People had to put up with all of those changes. First, they had to make them. Then they had to, to put up with, with the changes and how it affected their lifestyles. Some for the better, some not for the better. <clears throat> if we look at it from the social change, you had all of these uh, things that we talk about today. Mass migration of people within America and worldwide. Mass migration of people to cities from rural areas. Expansion of cities and infrastructure, women's suffrage, mass communication. One voice, 100 million audience. The same today as it was then. Just a different technology to, to achieve it. You had people living in the moment, women's suffrage, immigration law reform, sexual liberation, Freud linking sex and death in a book called Beyond the Pleasure, um, and uh, Harlem Renaissance. Trade unions and class divide, banking failures, war, Cold War, Atlantic Alliance, and the end of American isolation. All of that started back then. There are themes that keep recurring and are even talked about today. Uh, but when they started, it was very different than the world that, the, that Hemingway's generation had experienced before. So they had, to, they had to not only do these things, they had to deal with them. Yes? Um, why did you compare um, Kanye is one of the most popular social media personalities today. What, what about like Beyonce? Oh, I can do that. Yeah. Day, 
is it as strong or is does she surpass does she does she have like a higher popularity than you? I mean personally, um, I thought Kanye was kind of like is it because they're similar characters or is it because Well they like to me it's not popular. Sure. They're they they both have big numbers. So that was the starting point. And then if you look, yes, they are exhibitionists. They, they have certain characteristics that are, that are similar, so it made a comparison a little bit more meaningful. But the most important point was that they started with big numbers. Kanye was, and, probably, and is big, but it, at one time he was the biggest. Yes? Yeah, how, does, um, how does Hemingway at this time compare to say, Obama and Trump? Oh, well, Trump eclipses everyone. <laughs> Trump is even bigger than we would consider having it back then. I, 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 I'm going to look at that. I think that he is, only because I can't go on social media and find many other topics. Everything that I look at has a Trump angle, which, and I use it, that's the way it was with Hemingway when he's creating his lifestyle so that everything that you looked at had a Hemingway angle. And all of the conversations about his lifestyle usually focused on his old lifestyle. So when you're talking about him as being the great deep sea fisherman and winning all of the trophies and things, first you have to understand that deep sea fishing was only a few years old when he was doing that, so there weren't many people. But when the people are talking about that, he's already in Africa big game hunting. And so people are saying, he's a great fisherman. No, no, he's a great hunter. It's just that he was always one step ahead. And so there was always a controversy about him. And that continues through today. He's still very big. He's still probably in the top 30 um, social media followings today, 50 years after his death. So it's, that's, that's one of the things that I thought was fascinating. And people are still talking about it. You know, uh, uh, every topic about Hemingway, there's two sides of it. Somebody says he did it, somebody says he didn't do it. Somebody says he was good at it, somebody says he wasn't good at it. So it's, it's still uh, a, a controversy today. And you had a question? Oh, yeah. Someone brought up the fact that uh, maybe there's more competition these days. Mm -hmm. um, do you think the fact that this has been going on for so much longer now, where back then it was kind of new, um, a lot of these outlets and media platforms that you listed, um, I think the population has become kind of desensitized and requires a bigger shock and awe effect to get those numbers where they need to be. Where back then it could be big game hunting and those type of things where now you have to go to a level of, say, Trump to get those types of numbers, right? That's a part of it. Um, but if you look at it, back then we were talking about air travel. Flying from New York to Los Angeles was you know, a major thing. Nowadays, if you looked at the news recently, they're talking about tourism to the moon. So there's always going to be something um, that's going to be a new development that people have to create and that people have to adjust to. The, the wild card in this is Trump. You know, Obama had big numbers, yeah, but that's, you know, not, on, not, not nothing spectacular. Trump is just, you know, he's just kind of taken over social media. And uh, that's, you know, that, that's just something that he set out to do. And this is the other point. If you were to look at a similarity with Trump and Hemingway, Hemingway set out to do this. He said in 1926 he was going to be the best known writer. He didn't know he would be the best known person in America. And I'm only looking at information from America. If you looked outside of the U.S., it would be significantly bigger. And, uh, you know, if you look at up, up until this current time where Trump has said, I'm going to dominate social media. It's a direct strategy that he has. And I, I can't say that it, that it is, it, it, well, it was an objective that he has. I can't say there's much of a strategy behind it, but it's just nonstop. Yes? Kind of building on what you were saying, like you were mentioning that there was equally as much competition back then, but do you think it was also harder to reach different competition? Like if I had a favorite musical artist or a favorite author, I was going to go to the store and I was going to buy their book. 
versus now, you know, I have access to so many artists, even if they're not my favorite artists or favorite authors, like on my phone and on my computer. So even if someone's not my favorite, I still have access to them and they still take my time away. Yeah. Versus back then, you know, there wasn't as much of that. Do you think that also affect views and stuff? Like maybe I've listened to Kanye all the time if I only had one or two records at my house. Versus now I have, you know, every artist and every song pretty much at my fingertips at all the time. Yeah, that, well, I would say that that is more a function of the choice giving rise to satisfaction with a shorter attention span to it. There were certainly a lot of artists and articles and information available then as it is now, but through different technologies. So you, you yes, and you couldn't get it instantly. Um, as, as an example, one of the books I use, I had to do an interlibrary loan, so I have to wait two weeks for it. That was not uncommon back then at all. But there were libraries. Um, one of the statistics show that 65% of the American population went to the cinema once a week because they showed the newsreels. So you could get your world news and you could get a, an, an entertaining movie in the cinema. And uh, so th these are things that were not available at your fingertips, but everybody did them. Everybody got the newspapers. People read magazines. They exchanged them. Uh, there was a lot of conversation face to face now it's done, you know, device to device. And uh, so that, there are differences, of course, but I think that the other, the other point was, that was shown in the research is that the human brain hasn't changed. The technology has changed, so things are done a little bit differently. But people communicated then, they communicate now. They had curiosity, they developed things, they did things. Uh, now, it, you know, it's... Uh, May, you may be able to do more because you can do it faster, but that's uh, you know it's still that same process. And whether you're doing it as well is uh, the other part of that e question, because a lot of the information that's available at your fingertips is abbreviated. Other questions. Well, I want to thank you and thanks to our organizers and thanks to the students for attending.